Good morning, everyone. I think that's just gone 11 o'clock, so we'll kick off and start there. Uh, welcome to the first of two webinars being jointly presented between myself, Ian Parker, who's director of, of Whitley Stimpson, and Angus Aston, who hopefully you can see in, in the side window, and who's a director of, of Wise Investment. The webinar this morning will focus on pensions and particularly the recent rule changes around the annual allowance and the lifetime allowance, hence the title Making the Best of the New Rules, which we felt was uh, more diplomatic than our alternative title being Pensions, Another Fine Mess. I'll end the comparisons to Laurel and Hora Hardy there before uh, Angus stops talking to me. Uh, I think with that, Angus will give a, a brief overview of uh, of Wise Investment. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, right. Well, um, as those of you who've attended before, we uh, we were founded in uh, Chipping Norton in 1992 and have stayed resolutely uh, local to that area, um, sort of 31 years on. We're an employee-owned business, so um, our staff have a uh, a sort of direct uh, stake in the success of the business and it means you know, the better we look after our clients the the, the, the better it is for everybody uh, and in particular we we look to have long-term client relationships because financial advice investments pensions and so on are by their nature very long term um, and that's the nature of us and we do in the main pensions and retirement, um, managing investments, as it says here, um, and inheritance tax planning and sort of protection around that where necessary. Um, yeah, that's us. Brilliant. Thanks, Angus. So uh, just, again, giving everybody a brief overview of, of Whitley Stimpson, and I'm conscious that many of you will have joined us before, so, so we're well aware of this. Um, we were founded in Banbury in 1931 and have recently expanded, uh, now having four offices across the Thames Valley in Banbury, Bicester, High Wycombe and Whitney. Um, we offer the, the, the complete range of services that you'd expect from, from a, a regional firm of accountancy uh, services. So we offer tax planning, auditing, payroll and all of the usual compliance uh, aspects, so annual accounts, tax returns, etc. Um, we've grown steadily over, over that time, and we now have uh, about a headcount of just about 95 people. Um, so we like to pride ourselves on uh, the fact that we're big enough to, to give the, the holistic advice, but still small enough to care. And I think that's that's where we're very well aligned with WISE. As Angus said, it's about long-term uh, relationships that we build with our clients. And we're very proud of the fact that many of our clients have been clients of Whitley Stimpson for decades now, um, and, and long may it continue. So the, the, the general format for today is going to be uh, this webinar will be approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and then there'll be some time at the end for a Q&A session. Um, the team have put a message in the chat section uh, just explaining how the Q&A works, and please do use the Q&A functionality within Zoom webinars. Um, we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can, dependent on time. Um, but anything that we can't get to, if you could just leave your name, we will try and uh, come back to you after the uh, after the webinar uh, with, with with a separate email. Um, we will aim to wrap up well within the hour and get you back to the the beautiful sunshine before the winter weather really hits in. Uh, so with that, we'll we'll crack on. Um, up on the screen at the moment is a disclaimer. Um, all of the usual things, as, as it says there, the, the, the content of the presentation represents Angus and mine personal views. Don't worry, we, we, we will keep off our soapboxes, um, but it shouldn't be construed. We'll try. As, we, we will try. Um, as financial or investment advice, uh, and all information is based on our current understanding of, of law and practice, which you'll see as we go through the webinar is a very important thing to, to note. Um, and, and as it says there, past performance is not an indication of future performance. So, I yeah, that, that middle paragraph is particularly relevant for this <laughs> um, content, as you'll see. 
It is. It is. And you'll see why why we were we were very tempted to use another fine mess, I think, as well, weren't they, Angus? Um, so kicking off then, uh, just a brief sort of recap and overview on uh, where we are with pension contributions. So starting off here with personal contributions, uh, I'm not just going to read, read the points on the slide. I think most people are fairly comfortable with this now. The, the key here is that up until April 23, the gross contribution that somebody could make, and that is an important distinction. I think, again, most people are comfortable that with the majority of contributions into a personal pension fund, that um, you do get some tax relief through the pension contribution and, and uh, more uh, the government adds to the pot as well. Um, so gross contributions were the lower of 3,600 relevant earnings or 40,000. The, the key point there is um, relevant earnings and the definition around that. That's the one that people sometimes get caught out by. Uh, relevant earnings are um, earnings, basically. So it's uh, sole trade income, partnership income and employment income. And the employment income can include um, payments in lieu of notice and, and other payments received by way of an employment but the key here is it's not investment or passive income, so dividends don't count towards that, nor does income from most rental properties, with the exception of furnished holiday lets. Um, the, 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 the headline change in terms of annual contribution limits uh, from the budget back on the 15th of March was that the annual allowance threshold increased from 40,000 to 60,000. Um, and Angus will cover in a bit more detail what that might mean for you. Um, but that was that was the headline change in terms of individuals making annual annual pension contributions. There are also some separate tapering rules which reduce the amount that very high earners can contribute into a pension. Um, and that they kick in for people with an adjusted income over two hundred and sixty thousand. Again, we could do an entire webinar just on those tapering rules. Uh, yes, I, 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 the people might find themselves falling asleep towards the towards the end of it. <laughs> I, I I think they I think they might. Um, it, certainly, when I read through the legislation, I, I tend to, to nod off halfway through. Um, Shouldn't be saying that. So uh, yeah, we we won't go into too much detail. The likelihood is, if you're impacted by that, you will already know those rules have now been in for several years, um, and so the, the the chances are, if you are impacted by those those taperings, you you will already be aware of that. So but so basically, the allowances were made more generous, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, but where it sort of de derived from was the clamour over NHS pensions, particularly doctors who are working overtime, finding themselves actually worse off as a result of working more because the additional pension contributions tip them over the allowances. Um, so that was the, the change in the allowances was was there to sort of offset that. And now it's being used as an argument in the ongoing disputes over doctors pay. But anyway, that's that's <laughs> not, not for us to worry about. Um, yeah, sorry, and carry on. No, not not at all. Thanks, Angus. Um, uh, so then, company pension contributions. Uh, so the, the 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 key difference here is is that if a, a contribution is made by your company, whether it be yours if you're the main shareholders, or if it's your employer, um, you those contributions don't benefit from the additional tax relief that that the government would make on pen, personal pension contributions. So. Um, but the trade-off is that the relevant earnings and the 3,600 lower limits don't apply here. So actually, quite commonly, we will see people who run their own businesses making quite large pension contributions uh, from their companies into their pensions. Um, and the benefits of that are that it's not taxable on the individual as income, but it is tax deductible for the company. And with the now uh, newly increased rates of corporation tax now being at 25%, that's uh, quite a, an attractive 
corporate or company tax planning strategy. Um, you do, and I've put it on there as the bottom point, you do need to sort of watch the, the, the wholly and exclusively tests. Um, and uh, I think Angus and I will, will, will talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Right, so, so sort of um, weigh, weighing in, uh, what has continued under the new rules is, is the concept of carrying forward, which is if you have not used all of your allowances in any of the three previous tax years, you can add them to this year's allowance. Um, that's provided that you were already a member of some sort of pension scheme uh, in those earlier years without sort of delving into too much detail. The allowances were 40,000 for each of the last three years and now 60,000 this year. If you've made no pension contributions in this time, then you've got this year's 60,000 plus three lots of 40,000, uh, giving you a total sort of theoretically, if you had the resources available, um, of up to 180,000 pounds pension contribution this year. Um, yeah, and that's that, that's yeah. really where where you need to be a bit more careful, um, and really where my point on the last slide comes in uh, with regards to the wholly and exclusively test. So obviously, if it's a company that's making this sort of quantum of contribution, um, and you want or expect are expecting to get corporate tax relief from that, the revenue could have a look and say, is is this contribution necessary and and reasonable for the business? Now, in reality, and never say never, we, we haven't seen um, any challenges from HMRC along these lines, but clearly with the increased allowance, there, there, there is scope there. Um, and I think our advice would always be look at a package in the whole. So um, look at a combination of what you take as salary, uh, what goes in as, as pension contributions, and would that be reasonable for somebody in your role um, if you were working for another unconnected third party, and quite often it's right. actually actually yes. Um, so you know, in the main, people will tend to sacrifice some some salary levels to put more into their pension, um, and so the overall package is still not unreasonable. So yeah, so I have unreasonable. I have come across uh, uh, you know I've have spoken to people who've sort of misunderstood and thought well aren't I limited to whatever salary I'm drawing from my company this is a so they might be paying themselves 12,000 a year and I'm sort of slightly repeating what you said but I have still come across in recent times oh I'm limited to 12,000 a year into the pension um, that's not the case and um, I've yet to come across a challenge by the revenue against a, a any sort of reasonable pension contribution provided a company can afford it. Absolutely, absolutely. And you you briefly touched on something there, Angus, but it's quite an important point. Um, to be able to use the carry forward, you have to have been part of a pension scheme for the for the for the for the years that you're trying to use. That's correct. I mean, it doesn't have to be the scheme that you're the pension that you're contributing to. It could be some old, you know, previous work scheme that you had or anything, as long as you're not new to pension saving or uh, pension accumulation in, in the UK. That's 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 all there is to it. I mean, if you are in any doubt, obviously, on your personal situation, then it's worth having a chat with an advisor or an accountant. Absolutely. So we've, we've sort of talked about there how um, pension contributions made uh, by the company can be useful from a corporate tax perspective. Um, and Angus has got a, a, a nice table here, which just demonstrates uh, some examples. And there are hundreds of thousands of iterations that you could you could make um, yeah. this. These are just some examples that we've we've come up with. But it just shows so, the differences between um, how people could take some money out of out of a company. Yeah. So um, without kind of delving into all the workings, uh, the the line that says net amount extracted 
is what sort of falls out the bottom if you you have a say a company makes a pension contribution for you and has sixty thousand or sorry has sixty thousand available to sort of do something with either pay you more directly into your pocket or to put it via a combine uh, via a pension uh, contribution or some combination. So if you just go for salary, which I think a lot of people know is obviously the not not the best thing to do in this situation, with the employer paying national insurance, you paying national insurance and income tax, assuming you're a basic rate taxpayer. Um, what drops out the bottom is about forty thousand pounds in your pocket, which you might want for particular reasons but then if if you want the cash the better way to do it would be a a dividend payment or in this case assuming you've no other earnings a a mixture of um, salary and dividend which gives you that figure of 44,326 when all the taxes accounted for Um, if you just purely went for a pension contribution um, it would come out of the company uh without any corporation tax is a deductible expense um 60,000 lands in the pension so the bear in mind the money's in a pension not in your pocket so you can't spend it straight away which may be a problem but um if you're past the standard sort of minimum retirement age currently 55 you could in theory then take the benefits um, in practice, you probably wouldn't. This is for the long term. Um, but if you did, assuming simple situation, no other income, um, you could end up with a sort of 51,000 sort of net of the income tax that you pay on taking the, the money out of the pension. However, as pointed out before, you would then um, be subject to a future limit of 10,000 a year. So this is all, this is a bit theoretical. Um, but then if you wanted to mix the two bit of cash in your pot, a bit in the pension, um, it's sort of immediately you'd have 50,000 in a combination of your pocket and 20,000 in the pension. Um, again, a bit of tax comes off if you extract the money from the pension at that point. Uh, so a lot of detail there. A lot depends on your individual tax circumstance. I think it's quite common for... Um, people to remunerate uh in terms of salary plus dividend um if they control their own company um up to the basic rate higher rate tax threshold roughly 50,000 just over and then if there are surplus funds in the company um it's quite common for them to do pension contributions um, assuming that you know that meets with their with your sort of general objectives of putting money away for retirement absolutely and i, I mean that's it's a very common structure in terms of what we see day to day um as i said we, we've put some examples there actually um we do then tailor this to to individuals um sort of bespoke situations um and one of the drivers is quite often uh that people want to keep their income uh, just below the the 50,000 basic rate threshold as, as Angus has said because uh, above that you you start having potentially having to repay um other benefits like for example child benefit um uh, and and those sorts of things and actually they can be be very useful for people to keep. So um, whilst this gives some ideas, um, it, it just goes to show how many options people people do have. Um, yeah, uh, just to add, I mean, we focused on what if you've got a company, but if you're, j- j- you're a salaried person uh, working for another company, you might want to discuss with them if you're you know if you're a high rate taxpayer for example um and you get a bonus um if it's surplus to what you need in terms of income could you consider would your company consider paying that into your pension for you there may well be a workplace scheme anyway um and particularly if you're 
earning over a hundred thousand, which may not obviously apply to everybody listening, but uh, if you are, you're you're losing some of your well, you're losing some or all of your personal allowance as you get up to sort of past one hundred and twenty five odd thousand of of earnings. Making a pension contribution can get that back for you, so it's still a pretty valuable thing to do. Um, we will be moving on to the lifetime allowance and the, the rule changes there, which sort of slightly double edged, but um, you know, on the whole, are favourable towards pension saving. Thanks, Angus. And um, whilst we'll do the majority of questions at the end, we have had a question which I think is very relevant to this point. Somebody's asked um, the 60,000 allowance um for 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 an employed individual is that the combined employer and individual or is that just the individuals yes so it's the total of all pension contributions wherever they've come from whether you've sort of reached into your own pocket um or had it deducted from your salary um and the employer contribution so it's the total of the two perfect so as Angus has said, that's a, a, a sort of fairly whistle-stop tour of the change in the annual allowance. But in reality, um, we, we we weren't blown away when that was announced in in the budget. That wasn't the uh, the sort of rabbit out of the hat moment. I think um, the, the the changes to the lifetime allowance um, were potentially a lot more unexpected, weren't they, Angus? Well, yeah. So there was a. There were rumours circulating the day before the budget, which would then have been whatever, Tuesday, the 14th of March or whatever it was, um, that the lifetime allowance was going to be reset to where it had got to in 2010, which was 1.8 million. That was the that was the sort of word on the grapevine. Um and there was nothing sort of inkling about what we've just talked about, the increase in allowance. If anything, there was talk about it being reduced because of the the cost in, in to the Treasury of, of high rate tax relief. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise, the thing increasing to the, the contribution allowance increasing to 60, but not as much as the sort of ripping off of the lid on uh, the value of your pension benefits um, by the scrapping of the lifetime allowance now I, that title slide has got brackets soon to be defunct but actually sort of not quite um it's a bit more complicated but what's happened um i don't know we have probably move on to the next slide ian you could probably flip us over is that um uh the government and well, the Treasury, Jeremy Hunter said, we want to scrap the lifetime allowance, but put a cap on the tax free amount that you can get from your pension or pensions. Um, and those are the those are the two directives passed to HMRC. Um, and I don't often feel sorry for HMRC, but in this instance, I, I sort of do, because um the actual implementation of that is really quite complicated so the legislation is being drafted there's a consultation with industry and um you know interested parties um all of the major pension providers prudential aberdeen which used to be standard life and so on and so on are trying to get their head around the rules and still don't have a hundred percent clarity on on actually what it's going to look like um and there's a political angle which is that labor have said if they get into power they will reinstate the lifetime allowance which is a a uh an alarming prospect um whatever your politics because as an advisor it just creates a further minefield it simplifies nothing but anyway um, I hope the banana skin is obvious. Uh, you know, decisions made now could be, you know, 
under under the rules as we understand them could could come up and bite us later but I, I we don't know for sure so i'll do my best to explain where we're at um yeah i think probably let's let's skip on to the next one right so where we were was there was a cap on the value of your uh pensions whether that was income or cash that you received um that had originally started at one and a half million when these rules came in 2006 increased to 1.8 million as i say by 2010 and there it was supposed to stay until austerity came along and it was gradually stepped down and down and down um and at each step down if your pension benefits looked like they were going to or did exceed that new allowance you could protect protect the previous one with for the most part the quid pro quo the trade-off being that you would no longer be able to contribute a couple of exceptions so we now have this mishmash framework of several different types of exemption or protection um and unfortunately those rules are, are, are still with us and will not be going away um in the old days uh up to the 15th of march this year um if you'd exceeded the lifetime allowance there'd have been a tax charge which might have been 55 percent if you took the excess as cash in your pocket or 25 percent if you left the money in your pension fund to draw income from later on which you'd pay income tax um as of 15th of march the LTA still technically exists, but it's now the tax charge is now zero. So if you were taking benefits now, there'd be still an analysis of your lifetime allowance position, which is a bit of a rigmarole uh, for pension providers. But what drops out the end is you pay no tax. So that's fine. Um, this is while all these details of how you actually write it into legislation that you undo the previous rules is being worked on this year um so it's all nice and simple lifetime allowance gone i'm not sure be replaced with um oh hang on i'm skipping ahead a bit am i um you were a little bit i think I, um so i think so the, we were going to look at what happens to your pension when when you die um and, and broadly okay. so, yeah. so this is this is important um under the and this is where there are a few gray areas um under the uh old rules pensions were not well, old still some of it current this year pensions are not subject to inheritance tax and in any, if you died before the age of 75 your beneficiaries which could be your spouse or your children or anyone else could basically have that fund tax free if it exceeded the lifetime allowance there'd be the usual lifetime allowance tax charge but then everything else would be tax free um uh if you died before 75 but if you died after 75 there'd be income tax payable um it looks very much like well it will change from the 6th of april 2024 um and we'll look at that as far as we can in in just a moment absolutely so and i think um again most people will be familiar with it but if somebody died after age 75 and they passed their pension on and the beneficiary started to draw that down, they pay income tax at their marginal rate. So if you've got somebody who, let's say, earns 60,000 a year as a salary and they start to draw another 20,000 a year from uh, a pension that's been passed on to them, that would all be taxed at, at 40% in, most, in, in, in all likelihood. Um, so that's right no, but the but the critical point was that you had some control if you nominated your children even adult children as potential beneficiaries um then there would be no capital tax on the transfer into their names if they chose to just leave the pot of money alone 
Um, it was only when they drew, which could be 20 years later, that they would they would pay um, income tax. Absolutely. Absolutely. But as you say, this is almost certain. Um, nothing, nothing's entirely certain, but almost certain to change from, from April 24. Yeah. Um, that, that then leads us to where, where we are now, I suppose, Angus, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So um, as I've said, the lifetime allowance on the lifetime allowance itself as a principle will be scrapped from the 6th of April, the 2024. The, say the current tax charge if for exceeding lifetime allowance is zero. Um, and this is where the political angle comes in because Labour have said they'll reinstate it. We don't know how or anyway what that looks like. Question, if your pension benefits are going to exceed the lifetime allowance, should you take them now if you're allowed to so that you pay zero tax just in case they come in uh, that's a real gray area um and it's very difficult to advise upon because we you know we can't account for what the rules might be in the future but there it is there's a bit of political jeopardy in there um so basically it doesn't matter how much income you get from a pension fund or various pension funds there will be no lifetime allowance test and no lifetime allowance tax however the tax-free lump sum that you're allowed or total of tax-free lump sums is going to be frozen at 268,275 pounds so this is going to be called the lump sum allowance and there's another allowance, which is called the lump sum and death benefits allowance, which is that figure on the screen, 1,073,100, which was the lifetime allowance up until April this year. And here's our regime of transitional protection. If you had that before, then you could have higher allowances than the standard ones quoted on these. So nice and simple. And that, that's where a lot of the uncertainty is, because I, I I think my original take when these changes were announced in the budget and probably in early, uh, as the, the first raft of detail flowed through in, in early April this year, was that if you'd got protection, um, transitional protection, at, let's say, the I think the sort of 2014 or 15 rate, one and a half million, um, Actually, one of the big benefits of that was that you could, your twenty five percent tax free based on one and a half million protected would be three hundred and seventy five thousand. Yeah, and I I'd originally understood that if you were to make further contributions and potentially invalidate your protection, you'd then potentially just be capped at this new lump sum allowance of two six eight. But the the the, the and the more detail that's come out, that's not necessarily the case anymore, is it, Angus? Um, yeah, so that's that's what we think it looks like, and that's what the industry thinks it will look like, waiting for the final legislation, as I say. So under the old rules, if you had protection, you then made a contribution, apart from one or two exceptions, you would lose that protection. And I have heard of people making a grave error. They've made a £5,000 pension contribution, and suddenly they're they're in they've been in for until now they've been rescued they've been in for a massive tax charge on their pension fund as the result of putting in a relatively small amount of money um it looks like that you will not in most cases not invalidate the protection that you have by making a further pension contribution but you will still be subject to that tax-free cash and that lump sum on death limit. Okay. Yeah. So this is where, I mean, we cannot possibly go through all or yeah. even any of the potential permutations. Specific advice will be needed. Um, my instinct says wait until we actually get the final rules. Um, and if you're worried about political risk, it doesn't look like there'll be an election, he says, guessing um, until at least autumn next year so they'll be sort of between april and october as it might be <laughs> <laughs> you're a braver man than i am Angus. enough enough said i'm not going to make any predictions about that um yeah so 
let's move on, shall we? So that, um... Right. So briefly, I think this is probably obvious now, but um, if your limit on tax-free cash is £268,275, it, it will be the, the accumulated number of tax-free amounts that you've received, so whether that's from an occupational pension scheme, your standard pension. So you, you, you could have pensions worth £2 million, for the sake of argument, you will be limited to £268,275 of tax-free cash. Um, and if you've got a multiple range of schemes, um, you're limited to 25% from each one. Um, so that's still broadly at, at the same rule as it was before. So you can't say, I've got a £100,000 pension, great, I can have all of that as tax-free cash because it's less than £268,000, £25,000 on a £100,000 pension yeah. fund. Okay, and then um, the... yeah, nothing more complicated on there. And then the lump sum and death benefits allowance. Yeah. Okay. So this says that when you die, the maximum amount that your beneficiaries can receive, free of tax, as a lump sum. And I believe, and I'm waiting for clarification, that this is only the case if you die before you're seventy-five. Um. The, the the maximum is one million and seventy three thousand one hundred less any tax free lump sums that you the member took or the member took during their lifetime. So if you'd taken the maximum two six eight two seven five, that that potentially would be sort of nearer seven hundred and forty thousand. Uh, well, it's getting on for a sort of eight or two hundred sixty eight times three, basically. Right. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Um, some fun, uh, yeah, pretty much 800 and a bit thousand. Okay. Um, anything in over that is going to be taxed at the recipient's marginal tax rate. And bearing in mind, we're talking about lump sums here. It looks like any income drawn from pensions by a beneficiary will be taxed at their marginal income tax rate, regardless of the age. This is what the next slide says, but we can skip over it. Um, regardless of the age of the member's death. So that's the contrast with today, where if a member dies before 75, then income is tax-free. So we're reverting back to the rules as they were in about 2015, basically. That's what it looks like. Fine, which feels a little bit like it's an inheritance tax charged by the back door, um, but called income tax because it's, you know, it, you're not you're not subjecting that excess over the the one million seventy three thousand one hundred two inheritance tax, but it will be subject to income tax at the marginal rate, which, as you say, as a lump sum, could quite easily push somebody to be a forty percent taxpayer, which is the same rate as inheritance tax uh yeah in a, in a way i mean you you could look at it like that i mean i i would you know i could as a as an advisor i could get on my high horse about sort of <laughs> taxes on but the but the alternative view and i'm agnostic about this really but pensions were never meant to be an inheritance tax escape vehicle um you know that was never the intention the Conservative government put these rules in place in around 2015. And at the time, I don't want to say I told you, but at the time I went, that's uh, that looks really generous, you know. Mm -hmm. And actually, it probably has changed people's behaviour. They've sort of, instead of taking pensions, they've probably leaned more heavily on non-pension assets, cash or, or their other investments that they've had. Um, because it tips the tipping the balance in favour of something that's inheritance tax exempt effectively, or at least very much more flexible. So yeah, you could look at it both ways. Fair enough. Your, Fair enough. You're far more balanced than I am. Um, so we'll, we'll gloss over this slide. I mean, that really just- Yeah, that's, that's basically what, what Angus has just said, which is that the 75 uh, age threshold is, looks like it's going to disappear um and and you'll be taxed on on drawing pension uh regardless of the, the member's age of passing um and then this was 
really just a, a, a administrative point, I think, Angus, more than anything else. Um, it's still worth it's not it's not quite as critical perhaps in some respects as it was before but make sure that you you, you're allowed to nominate who your beneficiaries will be of your pension fund regardless of its size um make sure that you keep that up to date and reflects your your current wishes and your your and your spouses if you're in that situation um sort of personal financial situation just to provide your family, as it might be, with as much flexibility as possible. Um, yeah, that's all that's to be said on that. Okay. So I think as a sort of roundup, then we're 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 fairly comfortable with the new annual allowance and the fact that you can now put sixty thousand subject to the to the standard rules that have been in place for a long time on on earnings and things for individuals. You can put sixty thousand pounds into a pension, and and potentially, if you uh, haven't done that for a lot or haven't used your pension for a few years, but have been a part of a scheme, um, maximum could be a, a, as much as one hundred eighty thousand um, at the moment in terms of using the carry forwards. Uh, but the question marks really are around the detailed legislation that's still to be finalised on the lifetime allowance. Um, and as with a lot of these things, the devil will no doubt be in the detail. Yes. Um, uh, listening to um, updates from the providers, I say, like of Prudential Standard Life, who have uh, teams of people combing through legislation, they have, they have much bigger resources than we do. They're spotting errors and omissions in, in what's being drafted and um, querying and all the rest of it. So you know that that's a good thing but unfortunately when a team of uh technical folk get their hands on on legislation that it tends to create more complication not not less <laughs> so um yeah we will we will see where it falls but this this is the hopefully given people a, a sort of broad picture of of where we're at um, um my conclusion is that pensions are still very much worth having but I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> Absolutely. And it, I won't hold you to this, but are you still quite optimistic in terms of timescales that they will have got the legislation to a workable level by the start of the new century? <laughs> um, well, they've been given a... They've been handed a remit by um, by the Treasury to for these rules, as the rules to apply from the 6th of April twenty. 24 and some rule changes to apply immediately so they've got not got a choice um there may be you know as ever with these things there may be some unintended consequences that will only become obvious in time really as people kind of absorb the uh uh the impact of of the new rules and and sort of adjust their behavior accordingly so we shall see there we go. So I think that that finishes off the slides. Um, as I said, almost bang on time, sort of 45 minutes through, um, which then then leaves us a few minutes for, for some uh, Q&A session. Um, at the moment, we've had one question that I can see, um, which probably is more, more up your street, Angus. How does the carry forward actually work? Do you have to call up your pension provider? And is that something that they then have to facilitate via a special mechanism. Uh, no, they so they so in the past before the carry forward rules existed, which is several years now, um, quite a you know, quite a few years. Uh, the pension provider used to police the amount that you contributed. Um now it's down to you the individual so if you made a contribution this year of 70,000 for the sake of argument um your pension scheme would probably write to you saying you've you've exceeded the standard annual allowance it's up to you um 
uh, to make any disclosures to the revenue via your tax return uh, if you are, are liable to pay an annual allowance excess charge, which is not very helpful, but that's that's the situation. But normally what happens is that if you are in the habit of making um doing tax returns you just you declare this on on your tax return if it's a personal contribution um you're asked the question are you liable to pay an annual allowance excess charge but the revenue has a record of how much has been contributed for you because there's communication between the pension providers and the revenue so they can pick up if you've exceeded it they being the hmrc but ultimately you know it's down to you to self-declare which you know as a responsible citizen citizen you're um required to do because not to do so would be um breaking the rules so it, it's it, it's on you but there isn't a sort of police force out there to um to sort of look at your every move no Sorry, we, we, it's we, a, it is a little bit vague to be fair but it is i think i think um we tend to find so most people who are making these size of contributions are, are already as you said angus within the self-assessment tax regime um i would say probably the majority if they've got a financial advisor um then they if they've got a financial advisor, quite often they will have discussed that with them and the financial advisor would have done the calculations and said, the maximum you can contribute is this much. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. If they haven't got a financial advisor, quite often we will then pull together a summary. So we've got a record as to what their unused allowance is going forward. Um, so between ourselves, um, but sort of both parties, we, we, we do tend to get it to have it covered. But as you say, there isn't a... There is no specific mechanism, and it is very much a self-declaration. Yeah, you, you, and just to say as well, you absolutely need to watch it very carefully if you are this year or were in any of the previous years over the thresholds for the tapering of the annual allowance. Yeah. Because the, the, the thing is, if you make a pension contribution, that affects that tapering as well. So it can get quite... Um, the calculations can get quite untidy. Um, I mean, if I if I was uh, in the government for the day, I'd do away with those tapering rules altogether. But, <laughs> uh, the other thing to say about the carry forward, if you think about the four tax years you have to work with this year, and then the three, so this year, and then the three previous ones, it works that you 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 use this year's allowance first, and then if you go over that, you refer back to the earliest of those three tax years. So because the allowance was 40,000 in the last three years, you could put in 60 plus 40, which is 100. And then as the rules work, that these next two years are available for you next year. I hope that actually makes sense. Um, so you don't have to use all of these carry forward allowances in one go because you you refer back to the earliest of the three years first. And it's it's a massive if given the political landscape. But if nothing were to change, based on what you've just said, effectively next year, the you, you would be able to go up to 200, then it'd be 220. And then eventually when we're looking at potentially four years worth of the 60 you'll be at a maximum of 240,000 yes um assuming you don't actually make any contributions during this time yeah yeah, yeah. uh you've got a detail you've got to take off if you uh, you know if you're yeah. it's got a workplace pension that's got to got a tiny amount coming in for example you've got to watch how you've got to sort of account for that so that you, you're using some of that annual allowance there Anyway, absolutely. Be too much um, detail. So someone's asked, do you have to make a tax return specifically for the purposes of the annual allowance? And what if you don't file a return for, for any other reason? So um 
the, the short answer is if you're comfortable that you haven't breached the overall annual allowance and that's using your carry forward allowances as well yeah then there is no specific obligation to file a tax return for that purpose but what we do see is that let's say for example using angus as an example somebody's put seventy thousand in um if they're not if they've never filed a tax return they may well get a letter arrive usually six or seven months after the end of the tax year just saying we've had contact from your pension provider and can see that you've put this in um are you comfortable? And, and you can usually cover it off with a single letter response, just saying, yes, I've considered it. Um, and this is why I, I, I didn't feel the need to, basically. Um, I'm going to come in with a question now to you, In uh, Where you have a, a sort of a high rate, say a high rate taxpayer who just chooses at the end of the, sort of towards the end of the tax year, say, to make a personal pension contribution. So they're high rate, earnings income taxpayer they've got the earnings to justify a contribution etc um they're going to get on a personal contribution automatic basic rate tax relief which the provider claims for them what should they do to make sure that they get if they're not ordinarily doing a a, a tax return because all their earnings are accounted for paye or their tax is accounted for on, under paye what should they do to make sure that they get the additional the extra high rate tax relief on that so contribution you, you've um you really if you're towards if you're making this towards the end of the tax year which is most common most people um will will make these typically in february or early march as part of some year end planning yeah at that point, you're so close to the end of the tax year, the advice is actually we'd just register you for self-assessment or, or you could register yourself, for self, register yourself for self-assessment and then file your tax return as quickly as you can. Right. OK, so you would just you would then say, oh, crumbs, I'll do a tax return. Um, uh, absolutely. The help of an expert if, if needs be. Um, if you'd made it earlier on in the year um, as, a, as a personal contribution, then actually I'd say give the revenue a call. Um, be prepared to be on hold for anywhere between an hour and three weeks um, and get your tax code updated to reflect the fact that you uh, right. um, made that contribution. And then you should find that actually they, they are able to sort out your tax through you, your employment income for the rest of the year. Right. Um, and just on that, I mean, it's worth noting that, um, and I think, again, most people have, it, it's filtered through now because we're used to the auto-enrolment pension, but we do still come across people who have been enrolled by their employer into an auto-enrolment pension. They are a higher rate taxpayer, um, but the contributions that are being deducted are coming off um, of their net pay rather than salary sacrifice. And of course, if that's the, the, the case, you only get your basic rate tax relief. And unless you complete a tax return, you won't ever get your higher rate relief. And so it's just worth keeping an eye. Um, and I said I'd keep off my soapbox, but I would love for the revenue to start including the pension contribution boxes or figures on people's P60s, because at the moment we have to ask for usually the marked pay slip to see annual contributions made as well as the P60. Right, make my life a lot easier if they would put the pension figures on the P60. But that is just something to note that if you are a higher earner under auto enrolment, you might need to be doing a tax return, even though you might think that actually it's all accounted for through PAYE. Oh, right, that's yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, I will say that the salary sacrifice is is uh, uh, subtly very beneficial. So if you are in a workplace pension with an employer who isn't offering salary sacrifice um it's worth asking them why not um because i won't go into the details um the only thing to watch out for is it does mean that your contractual salary is reduced so if you're trying to get a mortgage or something then it, that would that would reduce the amount you could borrow on a mortgage for example but yeah that's that's something worth looking at as well if you're employed so there aren't any more questions um 
on the Q and A slide that's shown, both mine and Angus's email addresses are shown. If you've got any questions, queries, anything else that you want to ask, but don't want to do it in a public forum, please do drop us an email or, or pick up the phone. Um, otherwise, very think... very happy to have a chat with anyone, sort of without any obligation. Just in in general, I mean, if you're kind of really looking for specific advice, then you know we'd have to have a conversation about that. But you know, uh, yeah, please feel free to drop drop me or I'm bringing you into this as well I'm already in the line and we'll absolutely be happy to help. it goes back to the start we, we work in very similar ways so I could I could echo that um please do please do pick up the phone or drop an email um so then I think it's uh just to say thank you very much for attending and a, a shameless plug uh Angus and I are back to do this all again in a week's time uh but the next session is on inheritance tax and really how to approach some IHT planning and some some common methods that we see to, to perhaps mitigate some of the inheritance tax implications. So um, as I say, we, we have got another webinar next week. Uh, please do sign up for that if you're if you're interested um, and hopefully see you then. Otherwise thank you very much for attending. Thanks Ian. Well done. Thanks Angus.